Night flushing or night ventilation. This is a method of cooling a building where uh, you open the windows at night when it's cool and cool air flows into the building, absorbs heat from the inside and flows out and carries the heat with it. And then in the daytime, you close the windows up again so the heat doesn't get in. Um, it's especially good in desert climates, hot, dry climates, and it's good there because there are big temperature swings day to night. It's very hot during the day. It gets pretty cool at night, so night ventilation is the, is the best technique to use there. It's also good for temperate climates, like here in Oregon. Um, we use night, night ventilation in our little house. We don't have air conditioning or a furnace, but we have uh, windows and we have trees for shade. And so in the daytime, we close the windows. In the nighttime, we open them up and the cool air flows through and it gets really comfortable. Night flushing uh, works with thermal mass. So during the day when the building is closed up, that thermal mass absorbs heat. Then in the nighttime, you open the windows, air flows through. The air through convection picks up that heat that was stored in the thermal mass and carries it outside. Then in the daytime, you close the windows and now that thermal mass has become cool again and it can begin absorbing heat from the room and the objects. Um, so it's pretty comfortable. This building is the EPUD building, Emerald People's Utility District. It's on Old Franklin Boulevard near the LCC main campus. And it was built in 1988 before LEED existed. Um, otherwise, it probably would have gone lead um, gold or platinum. So this building uh, uses a number of strategies. It's heated with passive solar heating. It's cooled with passive cooling, especially night flushing. It uses daylighting for its light inside and not many electric lights. It's filled with a thermal mass. The floors, the ceiling, the walls are all concrete, and then there are short fin walls that stick out inside in addition. And then you can see from these pictures that on the south side are deciduous trees plus trellises with deciduous vines. So they provide shade in the summer but let sunlight in in the winter. In any event, uh, the cooling is primarily provided through night flushing. So the windows open at night, air comes through, it picks up heat off all those masses of concrete and carries it outside, and then in the daytime the windows are closed up again. Another strategy, this is not night ventilation, but it's another strategy, is called the earth tube. And it's based on the fact that a few feet below the surface of the ground, the air stays a constant temperature <coughs> around 55 degrees Fahrenheit, winter and summer. And so um, you can bury these large diameter tubes in the ground several feet down. And the air in the tubes in the summertime will be cooled. It'll be pre-cooled and then you can use natural ventilation to pull that cool air through the building or you can supplement it with mechanical fans. And here again you see the Aldo Leopold Center in Wisconsin, a lead platinum building. Uh, one of the strategies it uses for cooling is these earth tubes. This is York University. This is, happens to be the computer science building. This is up in Toronto, Canada, and it uses cross ventilation as you see in the diagrams, and it also uses earth tubes buried in the ground. And <clears throat> the earth tubes buried in the ground help supplement the cooling from the cross ventilation. 
multiple methods could be integrated together, as you can see. In a high-rise dwelling in Africa, residents cultivate crops in the lower levels of their structure. They use precisely tuned stack ventilation to maintain their gardens and their living spaces at just the right temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide level for themselves and their food crops. An underground cellar, the coolest area in the structure, is kept cool without refrigeration using evaporative cooling. As heat flows upward through the tops of the chimneys, cool air from the cellar is pulled toward the living quarters and passageways. Thermal mass, stack ventilation, solar chimneys, and night flushing keep conditions constant inside while temperatures in this desert climate fluctuate from 107 degrees during the day to 37 degrees at night. The inhabitants of this structure are mound-building termites. And this is what a termite mound looks like uh, with this particular species of termite, the mound-building termite. The picture at the top is uh, an art artist rendering showing the various parts of the termite mound. So their passive cooling system is extremely efficient in a desert climate where it gets really hot during the day and pretty cold at night. Termites are an example of an interesting kind of animal called the social insect. Um, social insects include termites, bees, ants, and one thing that is really interesting about them is that they, uh, they have tiny brains. Human, human brains have about a million times more neurons than ant brains or termite brains. And yet, they work together and develop these remarkable systems, uh, including, in this case, a remarkably fine-tuned system for cooling in a desert climate. Social insects make us think about where is the dividing line between individual and community. So you could think of the human body as an analogy. In our body, each of our cells has a specialized job to do, and each cell, and we have many of them, each cell has a particular job to do. The cell doesn't really think in the traditional sense of the term, but it does perform its function and it does communicate with the other cells to keep everything functioning properly. And those cells together form a human body uh, with a brain that is able to think. This is an example of another property that we find throughout the world, uh, the property of emergence. And emergence is a quality of every complex system. Emergence means that you could not predict what the overall system was going to be just by looking at each individual piece. It's only through bringing together the individual pieces that new unpredictable properties emerge. Social insects are like this. If you are interested in this subject, there's a, a classic work uh, called superorganism, and uh, scientists use the term superorganism to refer to colonies of super of um, social insects. Anyway, this book called Superorganism. It was written a few years ago, 2006, I think, by the great entomologist Edward O. Wilson, who also writes a great deal about um, uh, life in general. So Edward O. Wilson, he's my hero. Uh, look up his book, Superorganism. Maybe look it up on Amazon and just read a summary. Anyway, uh, mound-building termites are social insects who have figured out this way to do passive cooling in a desert climate. And so 
some architects were building this high-rise office building and shopping center in Zimbabwe, Africa. Uh, here it is pictured, the Eastgate Center. Now, you may or may not care for this particular architectural style. This was built in 1995, a while ago. But what's noteworthy is the cooling systems. The architects decided not to install air conditioning at all, which is remarkable since this was in Africa. And at the time, in 1995, they saved 10% uh, of the construction cost by not installing a cooling system. Since then, this building has used 35% less energy than a similar conventional building. So this is an example of um, initial design costs and initial construction costs saving some money, but really the bulk of the money savings come over the life cycle of the building. And so if you were to do what's called a life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment, you would find an even greater savings than the initial construction just by looking at the life cycle energy costs. So this building, like the, um, like the mound building termites, uses all these methods, stack ventilation, solar chimneys, night flushing, and thermal mass.